Welcome, everybody. My name is Christy Craig. I am the publisher here at Hidden Timber Books. I'm so happy that you're here on a Sunday afternoon. We have been doing this small press author reading series for a little over a year now, which began um, when everything started shutting down, but it has quickly turned into a really nice way to um, connect with authors near and far um, and to allow other people who might not get to see those authors in their independent bookstores where they live. So just it's become a, a way to build community online, which is odd, but there it is. And it's been really a lot of fun. So I want to welcome Denty W. Moore. I'm super excited to have him today. He's an author that I refer to often. I, I teach classes on flash nonfiction. I like to write flash nonfiction. I, um, I have a, several of Denty's books on my bookshelves, and I often send people to those books because there's just wonderful information about the craft, but also I love his writing style. So I'm thrilled to have you here today to, to talk about your, your book. Just to give you guys a little bit of information about Denty W. Moore, if you are not familiar with him, he's a former zookeeper, a modern dancer, a professor, and a failed altar boy. He has authored or edited, edited numerous books, such as Crafting the Personal Essay, The Rose Metal Press Field Guide to Writing, Flash Nonfiction, Dear Mr. Essay Writer Guy, and more. He is editor-in-chief at Brevity Magazine, which is a wonderful online magazine if you love short nonfiction. And he has led workshops throughout the U.S. and abroad. We're here to talk about his new book, To Hell With It, of sin and sex, chicken wings, and Dante's entirely ridiculous, needlessly guilt-inducing inferno. Um, I've had a lot of fun reading this, so if you haven't gotten your copy yet, I, again, I'll drop in some links in the chat box so you can check that out. And welcome, Denti. Thank you so much for being thank, here. And thank you for hosting, Christy. And thank you, everybody who came. I can Those of you who have your cameras on, I can see you. And I see some friends' names out there. So I want to thank my friends uh, and my new friends who've shown up. Excellent. Well, I wondered if we might get started with um, you just sharing a little bit about, I don't know, your, who you are as a writer. Um, often, you know, our journeys change from years to now, then and now, and how you came to write this book. Who I am as a writer is, uh, well, that's a big question. I've, I've been writing something or other since, you know, since I was a boy, uh, the, the old story that, you know, you wrote, a, you wrote something in second grade and, and the kid next to you liked it. So you realized you were a writer, like that, whatever it was I wrote was probably three sentences long. But I've had many iterations over the years and, and got serious about writing in my third. Well, I did some time in journalism, the old fashioned newspaper journalism, and then got serious about writing, personal writing, the sort of things that I've done with essay and creative nonfiction and memoir. That started in my 30s. This book that we're talking about, to hell with it, uh, I guess the trajectory is kind of the same. I was in second grade when in, in Catholic school. Uh, when the nuns would start telling us about original sin and pagan babies who went to limbo because they hadn't been baptized and all these very arcane, very, very arcane rules that the Vatican and various theologians had put together over the years. And that doesn't make sense to me. And I was, I was a pushback kid and I go, sister, sister, that doesn't make any sense. And of course she didn't want a seven-year-old beast to be saying that, but, uh, it, Though, you know, there's a lot of wonderful things about the teachings of Jesus, and there's some good work that the Catholic Church and the Christian churches around the world have done, but there's also a lot of needless, complicated, man-made, bogus theology that has been built up around organized religion. So here I am, uh, I just turned 65 a little while ago, um, still thinking about it, still worrying about it. And instead of uh, a seven-year-old kid saying, sister, that doesn't make sense, uh, a writer has sort of tried to put together a book that explores in a, in a fairly humorous way, I hope, uh, why it doesn't make sense. What are, what are some of the biggest holes in the argument that we're all born uh, sinful and we're all uh, should be ashamed of who we are? And also, on the more serious side, how does that make us feel? Why are Americans so... American, that's not just America, but that's what I know best. Um, why are, are Western Catholics and to a certain extent Christians so 
so full of self-loathing. And I think part of that is being told that there's something wrong with us, that we're born sinful, that we're so horrible. All these rules had to be had to be put into place. And even then we're probably going to go to hell because we're weak. Um, I grew up in a very religious family, so I completely relate to um, to all of that. I um, I was looking through your book, and I love this quote in the prologue. The concepts of hell and sin, whether we actively accept them or not, have been tightly woven into our co core cultural tapestry, fashioning our churches and religions, obviously, but also our legal structure, our penal systems, our views on poverty and class, our classic and contemporary literature, all of those things. And, um, you know, it's just a reminder of like, you, you you dive into Dante's Inferno and how powerful one man's writing can be, how seriously we can all take something in a book. Yeah, I mean, when I started the book, I, I thought, oh, this is for kids who went to Catholic school or for adults who were kids who went to Catholic school because pagan babies and limbo and it was a fairly Catholic. But the more I explored, well, first of all, you know, second and third and fourth century theology, in other words, what did these people who organized the church, the formal church, do to the teachings of Jesus? Um, and then St. Augustine, who had some great ideas and some rather goofy ideas, and that all culminated in the, the work of Dante. The more I realized, no, that even if you're an atheist, even if you're raised on the periphery of religion, even if you're frankly Jewish or Buddhist, if you're living in America, um, these basic Catholic and then after the Reformation Christian ideas um, permeate everything. You know, every, certainly our art, walk through an art museum, uh, certainly our literature, certainly, uh, like I said, the, the judicial system and the penal system. It's, it's, it's hardwired into uh, our culture, despite, despite the separation of church and state. Which... Right, right. <laughs> So I, I want to ask you one more question, but then I'd love to hear you read a little bit from it. So what, you know, have you had um, feedback from your colleagues about your, the way you study Dante and, and how you approached it? I know some people can be so serious about that and you look at it in a, a nice lighthearted way at times. And so I'm curious if anybody was like, whoa, you know. Well, God. I'm not a scholar. I'm not a Dante scholar and I'm not, for that matter, a literature scholar. I haven't had any, I mean, maybe the, maybe the hardcore Dante uh, scholars have not read it yet. Uh, I've had, I've had one serious Dante scholar read it two two actually at this point. And, and both of them were highly amused. They, they knew what I was up to. They said, this is, this is fun. It's a great take. You make some great points about religion. Nobody's going to be teaching this uh, in a graduate literature seminar about literary history. However, uh, that's not, that's not my forte. But but so far, um, and I have you know I have friends who are, or who are or have been very devout, uh, in either evangelical or or other forms of Protestantism or Catholicism, who I thought boy they're going to see me saying some blasphemous things and how and they they're like yeah you know, we kind of agree with you, the church is greatly flawed, uh, so I I so far so far maybe today maybe today we'll see how the Q and A goes. So far, I haven't gotten, hadn't, haven't had any seriously negative pushback on my, on my goofy attack on, on the, on the organized religion. Good, yeah, it's key, it's good to keep it light when you talk about religion. I think yeah. <laughs> it can get so dark so quickly. Yeah. Well, I would, I would love to hear you read a little bit from it. Okay, I'll start. Um, I'll start with the prologue, or at least part of the prologue. Thank you for uh, quoting that one section. Um, so to hell with it. Let's start here. In one of my earliest childhood memories, my father, a sweet, clever, funny man who drank far too much, is standing in a hole, a mechanic's pit to be precise, a six by 12 foot rectangle cut seven or so feet deep into the cement floor of the local Chevrolet dealership's repair shop. This was before hydraulic lifts became standard. This was when a car would be brought into the garage and driven directly over the pit, when a mechanic would need to descend into the hole to access the automobile's undercarriage to change the oil, wrench off the muffler, or adjust the springs. My father, his friends all called him Buddy, was one of those mechanics, and for as long as I knew him, 
He dreaded the work. He hated standing in a hole all day, his blue cotton work shirt spattered with oil, grease, and metal shavings. He hated the fumes, the smells, the constant gashes and cuts on his hands and fingers. He did what he did to support his family, and frankly, to support his drinking. And he did this for nearly half his life. Or maybe, maybe the story starts a bit further back, say 3000 BC. It was about then that ancient Sumerians began to carve odd wedge-shaped symbols onto clay tablets. Once inscribed, those tablets of wet mud were left to bake under the fierce Mesopotamian sun, and they baked quite hard, so hard that a few of them remain intact to this day. The wedge-shaped symbols were an alphabet of sorts, and the surviving tablets send warnings of, dismal, dust, of a dismal, dusty underworld a dire place where the dead drink dirt and eat stones, about as joyless as it gets. Those Sumerian slabs constitute the earliest written account of what we now call hell, the deepest of all holes, and certainly the worst. But perhaps we should split the difference and just start here. Florence, 1308 AD. Dante Alighieri somehow got into his stubborn Italian skull to write a book the Medieval Traveler's Guide to Heaven, Hell, and Purgatory. Where to eat, where to stay, what to see. Okay, that's not the actual title, but only because publishers didn't have sales and marketing departments back in the 14th century. Instead, Dante titled his book Commedia, and while the Sumerians had cleverly scrawled their vision of hell into ancient mud, Dante's odd poetic undertaking attempted something even more ambitious carving a gruesomely vivid image of a roiling Hades into the wet clay tablet of our modern Western consciousness. And it worked. Better, I'm guessing, than the poet ever imagined. Dante's Inferno, a pulsing, perilous mixtape of Greek, Roman, and Christian myths and images, connected directly somehow to an urgent need in the human psyche to make sense of our inexplicable existence. And as a result, Countless readers fell for the adventure and fell hard, mistaking Dante's imaginative hallucinations for fact, misreading his vividly horrific accounts as the honest reporting of an actual eyewitness, as if the cranky Florentine had flounced into hell with a notebook and pencil, returning 24 hours later, safe though singed with a supernatural journalistic scoop. But he didn't, dear reader. He made it all up. I'll stop there um, for now. I think we'll do a little more reading after we talk. Thank you. So I love I love your prologue. What I really love about your writing, um, especially in this book, is not just how you play with um, words like you know being fun with the title of Dante's Inferno, but also how you play with form. And it's throughout the whole book. It's the the drawings that you include. Um, which if you haven't read it yet, there are a lot of fun. So introducing the next section and then the chapter on the boy who, who, oh gosh, what is it called again? The boy who returned, the boy who came from heaven or fell from heaven, or I had it I written down. It it's about the young boy who dies and comes back from heaven. I can't remember the great title, but, yeah. oh, bring on the ass trumpets. That's <laughs> what it is. <laughs> Nothing to do with the, I mean, it's all about the boy, but not the title. But that well, you know, the, the, that, the book the book that I'm talking about it in yes, that chapter yes is thank the boy you. who came back from heaven yes thank you um, and the form of that and how the story is really written in the footnotes and then all the way to um, the index which is a lot of fun it's not your normal index it's just to give you guys a, a hint of it in talking about Augustine Bishop of Hippo. You know, usually it's just one word of an index and the way this is written makes us cringe and the page number makes us doubt our worth and the page numbers and all those things. It's just, you know, add a bit of humor to it. So um, I really love how you play with form. And I'm just curious, you know, is that something that I guess, how does that work for your writing process? Do you is that one of your more favorite ways to approach serious topics is just to sort of throw it out there and start playing with it instead of trying to get to the you know, traditional way of writing about the spiritual journey or whatever it is? Yeah, I have a, um, 
I have a voice in my head, I guess a lot of people do, that uh, when I start droning on and on in a serious manner, I, I, I can't stand listening to my own thoughts. Uh, come on, didn't you get off it? So I have, you know, from my earliest writing, I've played with humor. I mean, the book is about hell and guilt and self-loathing, but I try to have fun with every chapter. And, you know, I'm not the first person who, who tried the idea that serious subjects can sometimes be approached through humor. We have a history of that, you know, going back forever. But in terms of playing with form as a writer, uh, it's fun for me. I guess maybe that's that's the simplest answer, I think. Um, I hope it's fun for the reader too. I'm not writing just for myself, I'm writing for readers, but I just I just feel like when you, you when you try different approaches, you come up with different uh, surprise answers. You you the whole to me, the whole idea of writing nonfiction is an exploration. You're not trying to lecture the reader or tell the reader what you already know. You're sort of trying to figure stuff out and you're inviting the reader along for the journey. Come try to figure this out with me. So coming at it in a different way, starting in a different place, using a different form, all of those things I think um, allow me as the writer to, to find surprises, which as, as a teacher, I always say, if the writer's surprised, then the reader's going to be surprised. And that's a good thing. Yeah, and I think your approach too is a great way to pull more readers into even talking about Dante's Inferno. I don't know that I would, you know, pick up a book that was just so seriously written about it. I I would feel a little intimidated, you know. So this is a nice, um, approachable way to yeah, I mean, for any, talk about. For anybody, for anybody on our Zoom screen who doesn't know about Dante's Inferno, it, it's a it's it's a beautiful poem written in Italian. Um, one of the reasons it's remembered all these years later is he was an amazing uh, mechanic of language, a brilliant artist in the Italian language. I read it in English. Um, a lot of people do. But it's also a ridiculous poem. It's he, he goes to hell, Dante, the character Dante. You know, the writer's named Dante. He creates a character named Dante. He invites Virgil um, from history to come along with him as his, as his, as his sidekick. And they go through the various stages of hell and they meet all these people. They meet all these sinners who've done horrible things. And a lot of the description is the various suffering that these sinners are going through. Endless, endless, gory suffering. But the sinners are real people. The sinners by name are folks that Dante the writer knew when he was alive and kicking in Florence, in, in, in Italy uh, in the 15th century. So it's a revenge fantasy. It's sort of like he's like, getting even with that he got involved in these political struggles that were happening in, in in Florence, his part of Italy back back then. And he was very bitter. And in fact, he ended up getting exiled from his from his home state and having to live in another part of what is now Italy. It wasn't called Italy back then. Um, so he's just really ticked off about that. And he's he's naming these people he's mad at and putting them in hell and then describing all the bad things that happened to them. It's a weird little revenge fantasy in addition to being an exceptionally beautiful poem. So you know, the contradiction there alone, you know, made me want to explore it more and write about it. One more quick question before um, I ask you to maybe read another excerpt. You know, you, you talk about um, in your book, just that heavy load of um, the religious teachings and sort of trying to like push through all that. When you were writing this book, did you ever hesitate in any moment of like, ooh, kind of watching over your shoulder like that uh, something bad might happen if you put this all if you put this all down for the whole world to see. <laughs> Those voices never go away. <laughs> yeah. um, I had a couple of like, well, as I said, you know, it's blasphemy. Am I going to get struck by lightning? I didn't. I'll be honest. I didn't have I didn't seriously worry about that. Um, I, I, I'm pretty much at peace with, you know, we'll call We'll call him God and use the male pronoun, but whatever power is out there, I don't think it. I don't think it's a human-like figure that has a name and a gender. But wh whatever that power is, and it, it's unfathomable. Um, I'm not entirely an atheist. I do believe there's something out there in the universe. I believe that that power would be okay with exploration, and and even even must have a sense of humor. So. For whatever reason, and I might get I might get struck by lightning as soon as we end this Zoom call, and then you can uh, say you were there. 
but for whatever, whatever reason, I, I, I don't really believe um, that you get struck down for questioning, for asking questions. In fact, I think asking questions is a good thing. Yep. Um, Carol, I see you have a question. If you would like to, you could pop on and ask yourself, you know, if you want to ask directly or I can read it for you. I'll go ahead and read it out loud. Um, so Carol's asking, how did you do the illustrations or drawings for the book? She says, I love the combo of words and pictures or doodles. Yes. So I didn't do the cover. Uh, another artist did the cover, uh, more talented than I am. And I love uh, what he did with it. Um, but I did do the sort of front piece to every, every chapter has its own little there's the there's the gophers, there's the woodchucks. Every front piece um, has some some illustrations that speak to what's going to happen in the chapter. Uh, I did them freehand, more you know, by and large, uh, and then just uh, scanned them into the computer and moved them around and things. Uh, what was fun is I was when I was you know I talked about how this book I didn't literally start this book in third grade. That's a, an exaggeration, but I did start asking these questions and in second and third grade. And I was an, in, I was an inveterate doodler. I loved to doodle. And my sister, who's not on camera, but I happen to know is on this call, can attest to the fact that this little guy with the big nose uh, is the same little guy with the big nose I was drawing uh, when I was six and seven and eight years old. So at first I thought, oh, that'll be clever and fun. But it, the process of doing these doodles and playing with these duels kind of got me back into the headspace of that little kid bored in the back of St. Andrew's Catholic School, second grade religion class, sort of listening, but sort of drawing pictures and thinking under his breath, yeah, right, that makes no sense whatsoever. Um, so it was a, sort of a fun process for me to, to pop back into what, you know, what, what it felt like to be that seven year old boy. But doing the illustrations was simply a matter of, you know, grabbing a pen and, and doodling again after all these years. Yeah, I think that's the, you know, the fun in um, incorporating play into our writing is it, it surprisingly brings you closer to a story a lot of the time. And not only just like opening that, you know, your creativity and your creative mind, like if you're stuck or whatever, but also revealing a little bit more here and there. Yeah, I had a teacher, David Bradley, he's a novelist. Uh, he's out in California now. He's a very talented novelist, but he was an early teacher of mine. And he talked about how, you know, any writing project, whether it's a one page poem or a 220 page book, you, know, you should begin in child mode. Just, just play, just put words down on the page and don't worry if they're wonderful and don't worry if they're erudite and don't worry what people are gonna think. Just play the way a kid would play in a sandbox. And then further down the process, when you're on the second or third or 10th draft, you can, you can get a little more adult about it and say, okay, what am I doing here? I've been playing for a couple of weeks. I've got pages and pages of material I've written. Um, where is this all headed? And that's the adult entering into the process and saying, okay, there's gonna be a reader. I'm not, I can't just play, I've gotta make sense for the reader. And then at the very end, the parent comes in, which is sort of like, are you sure that first sentence makes sense? Are you sure, you know, this this is this is the sort of material you want to show out in the world? But that sense of play is has always been very important to me as a, as a as the best way to start. And and it's the, and the opposite of it is writer's block. If you let that parent voice, well, this isn't smart enough. Well, this isn't a good idea. Well, this has all been said before. Well, you aren't a Dante scholar. What right do you have to talk about this? If you let that voice come in at the beginning, that's writer's block. So, if if you so if you sense uh, a, a sense of play, Christy, I'm, I'm very glad it came through. Great, um, Joy. I see you have a question. Would you like to unmute yourself? Sure. <laughs> Thanks, Christy. Mm -hmm. Hi, Dindy. Um, I know you mentioned writing as a you know exploration process of exploration. So I was curious, what was the most surprising thing you discovered about yourself by the time you were done writing the book? I did not know that the ending would be as hopeful as it is. Uh, you know, I knew I was, I was tackling uh, well, hell and sin and depression and all the evils and sins of the world. I knew I was tackling all of that. I thought, well, this is gonna be a, 
a heavy book and it did take me longer to write than other books that I've written um, for various reasons. Uh, but in the end, I, I found myself kind of feeling hopeful. It's a, I, don't, I, don't, I don't usually say you should write uh, for catharsis. You should write for an audience. You should write so that readers have an experience. It's not about you. But it, I ended up, it ended up being rather cathartic for me to, to wade through all this, uh, all my own, my own confusion and resentment about how religion had shaped my life. Um, and I was hopeful in the end that, you know, that maybe I can uh, forgive myself and let go of some of that negative, uh, negative teaching that had been I've been carrying around on my back for many, many, many decades. Let's talk about lust a little bit. I go through um, I go through the various uh, levels of hell as Dante did. So there's lust, there's anger, there's um, gluttony, there's I'm forgetting them all of a sudden. Um, all of the normal, all of the, all the horrible things that we do. Um, some of them or some of them end up being redundant. But uh, this is uh, this is the chapter where I, I tackle. Uh, or, or this is part of the chapter where I tackle lust. It's entitled The Burning Bush. And the um, quote that heads up the chapter is from Dante's Inferno, Canto Five. I learned they suffer here who sinned in carnal things, their reason mastered by desire, suborned. Nora Serafini had a toy cash register made of cheap painted tin. The register was about one quarter the size of a real one, but it worked, popping numbers up in a small window, ringing a shrill bell each time the money drawer slid open. Her brothers and I were playing Rock'em Sock'em robots just across the living room from Nora. Mark was handling the blue bomber while the younger Chris and I alternated turns with the red rocker, trying our very best to dislodge our opponent's grotesque spring-loaded head. My childhood was steeped in violence and plastic, so the battling robots should have held all of my attention. Yet that day, I found myself unable to stop glancing over toward Nora, standing there at the coffee table, ringing up brightly colored toy fruit for no one in particular. The term forbidden fruit refers back to the prohibited apple tree from the book of Genesis. In actuality, scholars believe the name of the tree as found in ancient texts, is more closely translated as pomegranate or quince. It hardly matters. What was forbidden was never literally the illicit fruit, but instead something meant more metaphorically, sexual awareness maybe, or quince-shaped parts of the human anatomy. If Eve had offered Adam a pomegranate, what would he have said? No, thank you, my dearest Eve too weird and sticky. Nora was six that summer, and I was just a year or two older. She had chestnut eyes, thick dark eyebrows, straight, straight brown hair that ended just at the tips of her tiny shoulders. I didn't have a name for the feeling inside that made me want to study Nora's every move instead of playing with her older brothers. All I knew was that I enjoyed watching this girl slide the miniature plastic apples and oranges back and forth on the table. I liked the way she startled every time the cash drawer opened. My memory is that I did eventually go over and play grocery store with Nora for maybe a minute until Mark's sharp rebuke bounced across the room. Why are you playing with her? Let's go ride our bikes. At age seven, my understanding of the Garden of Eden story was understandably simplistic. Adam and Eve were naked all of the time which just seemed silly. They had so many pets. Miraculously, the lions and tigers never ate the rabbits or chickens. Imagine that. One day a chatty snake suggested that Eve eat from a tree that God had previously suggested was entirely off limits. The snake was inordinately persuasive because Eve, despite the fact that she lived in paradise and had everything she could ever want, did just as the snake suggested. Then Adam did so as well. Shortly thereafter, God popped out from behind a bush and said, aha, gotcha. And then original sin, hell, evil, war, shame, 
guilt, all of the bad stuff. For the rest of that summer, Mark, Chris, and I played mostly in nearby Frontier Park, riding our banana seat Schwinn's up and down hills, stopping occasionally to throw sticks into Cascade Creek. I didn't see Nora around. Maybe she had gone off to camp. Still, the tiny chestnut-eyed girl dominated my dreams that summer. Actually, my dream, a dream that repeated itself for months and left me disordered and alarmed. It went like this. I walk up the Serafini cement driveway, looking for my two friends. Mark and Chris aren't around, but the garage door is wide open. Inside the one-car garage is spotless, barren. No rakes, no lawnmower, no bikes, no anything. Just Nora, raising her dark eyebrows to invite me in, then pointing at a toy casino slot machine resting on a windowsill. The undersized toy slot machine resembles the tiny tin cash register, but with a pull handle instead of keys. She motions for me to pull the lever. When I do, three reels tumble through pictures of cherries, lemons, oranges, watermelons, and finally land on flames on all three reels straight across. Nora laughs, not brightly like the real Nora might laugh, but in a deeper register, more sinister, as if she knew something. In the dream, we walk outside then into the Serafini's backyard, a yard that extends alongside the garage and behind it as well, ending in a tall hedge. Nora, still not speaking, points downward, and it is then that I see that the ground under the hedge is on fire. The flames are low to the ground, but they spread across the length of the hedge and threaten to come out into the yard. A woman on the other side of the hedge, the back neighbor, begins hitting at the flames with a heavy garden rake. She calls out repeatedly for help. Nora just continues to point at the fire, smiling. That's, I love that chapter as well. You can see people are clapping a little bit in their pictures and um, yeah, thank you for reading that. One of the other chapters that I really liked, um, especially the end of it was, is the hell hole where you write a lot about your family and I, you know, you've written about your family before. And I think I told you when we met the other day, one of my favorite pieces of your work is the video essay that you have up on tri-quarterly called history. It's just beautiful. And um, so that that chapter, I was drawn to it, and then the ending of it is just really wonderful as well, and gives us a different um, version of heaven and hell that I really I think is is great. And like you said, it's so it's great to question and explore kind of what our roots are, and then sort of where we go along our path and how we get to different understandings. So. I don't know if you um, want to read any part of that chapter or if you just want to talk a little bit about it is that, um, you know, when you write about your family, does that help you, I don't know, come to any new, did you come to any new understandings about them or about those relationships, you know, about how that transformed you to be who you are? I know those are like deep philosophical questions or whatever, but you know, um, yeah, there's some great photos in there too. I love those. Uh, you can't quite get the zooms. Anyway, yeah, it's hard to I'll find. talk. I'll talk because I'm not very good at holding up books. Um, so one of the indelible parts of my life um, is that both of my parents were orphaned fairly young. Um, on my mother's side, it took. It, there was always a rumor that her father had committed suicide. Uh, I was able able to. Well, I was able to track down that he was hit by a subway in, in uh, Manhattan, uh, in the Upper West Side. And I you know the date, I have the death certificate. And it, that's the, it was during the depression when the stock market was was falling apart. So it, uh, I, you know, I, I suppose he could have fallen in front of that train, but the rumors uh, that persisted that he had submitted, committed suicide seemed to be borne out by then. Um, my mother and her sister were quite young when that happened. And then their mother died about five years later. Um, you know, both both her both of my both of my grandparents on my mother's side died in their 30s. Uh, it's pretty much of a tragedy. Uh, 
My father's mother died in childbirth with his uh, giving birth to his sister. His father lived a, a, a while longer, but wasn't wasn't much of a father. Apparently, he was rather an angry man. Um, and then he died in oh, I don't know, 1940 or something. So all of my grandparents were gone decades before I was even born. Uh, my parents were lucky enough, I guess, to have been raised by relatives, not to go off to an orphanage, but you know, they had big holes. They had big tragedies, traumas and holes in their life. And as we know now, um, you know, that tends to go on to the next generation. Uh, as was the case back then, nobody talked about it. My mother didn't talk about her parents. You'd think she'd never had parents. Um, but when, you know, when I was when I was young, it just never came up. When I was old enough to ask questions, it was clear she didn't want to talk about it. Uh, my father, I don't know if my father even remembered his mother. He was so young when his mother died. If I asked about his dad, he changed the subject uh, or cracked a joke. So, I mean, uh, this sort of... Well, the whole the whole of depression, the H O L E, you know, of depression is is became a metaphor for the whole that is hell. You know, hell is a hole in the earth, depression is a hole in the heart, and that. And writing about my family, and I and I'm and thank you for saying it, Christy. I know I, I started writing about my my father especially, but my parents when I wrote the memoir between Panic and Desire. Um, you know, it's one thing to go through life saying, well, my parents. I'm sure made a lot of mistakes and they did um, and my father struggled with with drink all of his life he was a sweet sweet guy but never never could kick that uh, problem in his life uh, which started i think in his teens i don't know i wasn't born yet obviously um where am i headed with this uh it's one thing to say my parents made a lot of mistakes or my parents let us down my two sisters and i you know my parents didn't give us this or that or the sort of emotional support we want. It's another thing to try to understand why, like, you know, pa parents don't wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to, I'm going to do a half hearted job of being a parent. You know, I've had to understand through the years that whatever my mother's limitations were, are probably connected to all the horrible things that happened to her when I was young, when she was young and her reluctance um, to talk about it is, you know, is understandable. If I try to put myself in her place and imagine what it's like to lose your parents uh, so young and live in your live in your aunt's attic um, with your little sister, I want to try to think about why my father spent many, 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 many more hours at the corner bar than he did with his children. Um, I'm not happy about it, but I have to go back and see what happened to him. So I, you know, I, I said that writing is an act of exploration to try to understand and. I had to do research to try to, you know, to learn what my parents' childhoods were like. Everything from begging my whatever remaining relatives I had to tell me what they had heard or remembered, to literally going to the Manhattan, you know, records and trying to find death certificates. So, um, family research is, is an interesting thing. But in, in my case, it was again uh, not just like to have names and a family tree, but so much, so sort of to try to understand how. The problems of two generations, three generations ago, spilled over into two generations ago, spilled into my parents' generation, and how my sisters and I, um, it's my book, but uh, I believe my sisters, you know, they were there too, uh, how my sisters and I have had to sort of struggle in our own lives to to make sense of, of, of what all this legacy, this legacy of, of family trauma has done. Yeah, I, you know, I think that's what I really enjoy about writing um, personal essays and probably shorter because I can only handle so much. It's like you can only handle so much therapy and then you got to get out for a while, then you can go back in. But what I love about um, personal essays is that opportunity to explore and like, um, you know, I was telling someone recently that my mother was an artist, not, you know, out there in the professional world, but she painted like different styles of paintings and she signed them differently. You know, she would sign them her full name or initials or whatever. And there's a reason for that. I, I know. And so it's, I think about that, like you're, you know, a lot of that kind of writing is just putting the puzzle pieces together to figure out, okay, this is who she was, but also 
why I am whoever, you know? So it's just, I think that's the gift for me anyway of, of doing that kind of writing. Yeah, Beth, uh, looks uh, like you're raising your hand. I know, I decided to um, not be embarrassed by my ugly sweatshirt and actually, because <laughs> it's such a great reading and Dinti is so amazing. Um, I wonder if I can articulate this question with economy, Dinti. Your, you are attaching these gloriously rendered childhood scenes to the larger um, provocation of, of, you know, of the book. Um, and I wondered if, since you've done so much beautiful truth telling in your work, if you had access to all new stories that would illuminate this work or whether you, you know, whether you found yourself saying, ah, oh, I've told that story before, but I want to use it again. Should I craft it newly or should I discover a new relating tale? Um, I, I did worry because I do cover some of this. I think authors do this all the time, but uh, authors also worry about it, I think. Uh, I cover some of the same ground uh, in the story of my father's uh, pain and 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 failure and and singing in the bars and drinking uh, in this book that I covered in another book. In fact, I actually covered it in fiction and in the one book of short stories that I published. But I've learned something different about him and about how about the human animal each time I've, I've gone back into that story. So I do try to find new a new way of thinking about it, a new way of looking at it. Um, you know, I think my book Between Panic and Desire is an attempt to understand my father and how his legacy and absence shaped me. And this book, I, I think, has been taking, uh, taking it, you know, well, thinking of the hell metaphor, I'm going a little deeper down into the hole. Uh, trying to understand my grandparents' generation, even though I not only didn't meet them, but they died, you know, decades before I was born. Trying to understand what was going on in my grandparents' generation, and then you know, even further back, how they 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 come from Catholic countries. They came from uh, Scotland, Ireland, uh, what what back then was called Bohemia. Uh, they came from Catholic, deep deep Catholic traditions to America and brought those for good and, and bad, they brought all that Catholicism with them. So try to understand how Catholicism had, had shaped their lives uh, and then shaped their children's lives and then shaped my parents' lives. And then, and then you know, thank God for those nuns that they hadn't beaten me when I was a kid. I'd probably be in jail right now. Um, but trying to understand, you know, the, the line all the way through. So, yeah, I, 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 I did worry off and on. Um, well, I've thought about this before, but I, I also uh, try very hard to find a new way into the material or a new question, a new question to ask. Beth, we're going to be neighbors. I was, I didn't think I could ask you this publicly. Told, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for everybody who, uh, I've been trying, <laughs> my wife and I have been trying to sell our house for 13 months. The pandemic, the pandemic didn't make it very easy. Uh, we close. We know we didn't. We're closing on the house in a couple of weeks, but we got. We signed the final offer papers yesterday, so we'll be heading to Philadelphia, and I'll be buying Beth a new sweatshirt. <laughs> well, I I want to make sure that you know you are welcome here, boy. You are going to be so embraced. You are so loved, and I I meant my question not at all as a criticism, but because it is what we memoirists do we just keep circling back to those stories and bringing them up but I was thinking in particular not about your father but about this little girl that you had rendered so gorgeously and her quarter size you know cash register and whether you'd ever found her before for any other story you'd written because it was so magnificently rendered and mm. and therefore I wanted to just make sure you knew it wasn't it no 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 it was, it was applause for you her, um, na her name really was Nora her brothers really were Mark and Chris they lived about five houses away. I changed the last name. They had an Italian American last name. I used a different Italian American last name just I don't know, just just so I didn't get her in trouble with her husband. Uh, whoever I don't know when I I haven't seen her for 50 years. So goodness knows where she is or what she's doing. But yeah, Nora's Nora's very real. And um was I mean it seems weird to have a big crush on a six year old, but I was seven, so I think that's okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, Beth, for asking that question. 
Um, I, you know, you talked earlier about the ending and how you were, you didn't expect to come to that feeling of hope at the end. And I really love the epilogue. That's just beautiful. And, um, you know, one place that I quoted was when you talk again about Walter, who is a, a man you saw at a flea market and just, um, you know, what he says there, anything that keeps you alive in the darker times will at the very least afford you a modicum of time to find your way out, a chance to locate your own paradise, even a small patch of it, maybe just a cool breeze on a sweltering summer day. And um, I just wondered if you could tell us a little bit about Walter. I mean, he shows up a couple of times. Um, so the, the chapter on hoarding, uh, you know, it's a sin to, to collect too many things around you. Um, I ended up going to the world's largest yard sale, which extends from Chattanooga, Tennessee, all the way up into Michigan uh, on a one long highway. It's an annual event. It's a, you know, uh, and it's just yard sales, well, from Tennessee to Michigan, you know, yard sales uh, south to north across America. And I drove, I, I did the Ohio portion of it and I stopped at the, the, the Threshers uh, Museum yard sale uh, and flea market. And there was a fellow, this was in the middle of July. It was, you know, 90 something, some degrees, 100 something in the, in the sun. And there was a fellow named, who, who eventually told me his name was Walter, but he was sitting uh, in the sun dressed for winter. He's wearing triple flannel shirts and flannel socks and big boots and, and overalls. And he was, and the sweat was just pouring off of him. And I ended up having a conversation with him. And, and I don't know to this day whether he was trying to lose weight, whether he was a little bit loony, whether he was an angel sent from heaven. Uh, but he, he ended up making more sense than I thought. Uh, and 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 he's memorable, so I put him in the book, and 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 he surprised me by coming back for the prologue. I didn't, I certainly didn't plan, but I, I realized as I was writing the prologue that if you take his words, his exact words were anything that will keep you warm in the winter, will keep you cool in the summer, and that's why he was wearing such heavy clothes. Um, it didn't doesn't make sense if you're a physicist or uh, if you're a mother of just small children. But he was just so insistent that he that he was having the best time of his life, sitting there, sweating off buckets of, of 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 uh, fluids, because he was wearing so many clothes in the in, in the hot hot sun, and and that it was an air conditioning for him. Weird things that you know, weird things that stick in your mind or fascinating people that don't make sense are, are the best if you're an artist or a writer and. and and I, you know, and Walter, I don't know where Walter is. I don't know who Walter was, um, but he certainly gave me a gift that day. You never know where you're going to find bits and pieces of the truth, right? Yeah. It's yeah. all about paying attention. Well, it is about five minutes to three, and um, I've dropped a couple of links in the chat box. So scroll back, back through there if you want to check out Dinty's website where you can find out a lot more about um his writing and his work and then a link to where you can find his book online through bookshop which is a great way to support small presses independent bookstores building the community as we can and um there was one thing else i was gonna oh Vinti, i know you are you do a lot of um workshops and retreats and i know you've got one coming up is that correct that's um, is there a writing retreat you're doing with Allison I'm, Williams? I'm doing a, a retreat with Allison Williams called Rebirth Your Writing. It's a it's a five day retreat, um, all by Zoom. Um, we were going to do it in Costa Rica, but that didn't work out, so we're doing them by Zoom. Uh, it's all recorded, but we have we we've done we did it twice before. Uh, so there's writing time, there's classes, there's pitch sessions, there's coaching. Uh, 20 to 30 people there uh it's all recorded so some people you know some people can't make all of the events but they can read they can read them they can watch them later and uh last time we had people from korea dubai writers from korea dubai uh canada the united states in australia so it's an international class which is kind of fun a thing that zoom allows that you know 
uh, regular writers workshops don't but if if you I, I don't have the link ready in the chat but if you're curious about it uh, google rebirth your writing and maybe it's named dinty because there's not a lot of us out there and i'm sure the the link will pop up great thank you so there's still spots available if people yes, want to excellent and yeah. that'll be in the middle of may okay Wonderful. So there you are. You've got um, lots of resources from Dinty, um, including his wonderful book. So um, I want to thank you again for giving of your time and your wisdom and reading from your book today, Dinty. I really appreciate you being here. Oh, thank you, Christy. And thank you, Hidden Timber, for uh, being literary, such great literary citizens and, and making this possible. Yeah, you're welcome. I'm, I'm glad everybody was here this afternoon. Again, this is recorded. So I'll send the link out once it's done being edited and whatnot, and then you can share it with your friends. You can watch it again. And um, yeah, check out our website at hiddentimberbooks.com for more readings coming down the line, or um, check out our channel on YouTube to watch some of the ones we've had before. Beth Kephart, we had a wonderful reading on her memoir recently, so that's up on YouTube if you want to watch that as well. And Thank you so much for all being here. Hope you have a wonderful rest of your weekend. Thank you, Christy. Thank you, everyone.